The Entrepreneur's Library, Episode 70. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Mark Herbert, author of Managing Whole People. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Great to be here, Wade. I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. Will you take just a moment to introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about you personally? Okay. I am, uh, my original corporate training and experience was in the human resources area. I go back far enough that we used to call it personnel. I've since evolved from that into some C-level responsibilities and operations. And then on and off for about the last 15 years, I have operated as a management consultant working with organizations around their relationships, uh, ranging from Fortune 100s to small entrepreneurial businesses. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Now let's jump right into your book, Managing okay. Whole People, which was made available for purchase back December 10th, 2008. And Mark, we're going to move quickly, but our whole goal here is to cover the top questions that our audience wants to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing Managing Whole People? The big inspiration for me, Wade, was was coming up through a time where the whole idea of human resources management and leadership and everything was not maybe held at in particularly high esteem. And a number of, of different conflicting philosophies out there ranging from you deal with people on a purely arm's length basis to a period in the 80s and 90s where we, we got almost to where we were providing therapy was to communicate to people that when we are managing people, we manage them one at a time and we manage the entirety of who they are. That does not mean that if you're a manager or a human resources professional that you're a therapist or you're a parent, but it does mean you have to manage each person as an individual and manage the person in front of you. Okay, so what makes your book different from others regarding a similar topic? Well, what I have been told and what I intended when I wrote it is in candor, I did not write my book as a as, as just as, as necessarily as a how to or this is the perfect way I do things and everything is what I tried to incorporate in my book was over almost 30 years of experience, uh, including the mistakes that I made, the things that I learned, but also sharing with people in the book the results of my some of my experiments and the, and the positive outcomes that came out of that. And, and I think from that perspective, uh, I like to think that it's practical. Uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to follow the things that are in my book. Neither do you have to be a human resources professional or an academic. And, and I think in that, what I've been told by people is, what they've liked about it is I can pick up your book, I can read pieces of it, and this is something I can apply real time today. Excellent. So, so Mark, you just started to answer uh, one of my next questions, and that was really, how would you choose the reader to engage with your book? Is, is this one mm -hmm. that they should start from beginning to end? Or or like you just said, um, you know, go in, cherry pick what you need, and then and then go act. You know, Wade, what, different people react different ways. One of the things that the way I read things is, and the way I look at things, whether I'm reading a novel or whatever, I look at context. So the way that my book is structured, the initial part of the book in part one is all is about creating context. Okay, what, what is it that I mean when I talk about managing a whole people? One of the things that you'll hear me talk about a great deal is the, the management system I created called Moving from Compliance to Commitment. And I think that context is important for people to have for me. Now, on the other hand, there are there are sections that it breaks it down into, you know, different things that you want to consider in the application of that. And so what, what I would say is I like to think that I wrote the book in such a way that if there is a particular issue that you want to focus on, you, you can find that in the book. On the other hand, if you want to figure out what motivated me to write it and, and what is the contextual factors, I think that's in there, too. Great. So now that we know the backstory, you know, the inspiration, uh, a little bit of what differentiates it from other books, uh, this is my favorite part where I'm just going to hand off the mic and ask you to really uh, just take us through the book from, from A to Z and let us know what it's all about. Will you do that for us? I can do that. Thank you. I can do that. If we take a look at it, the first part of the book is, like I said, talks about my, my system. 
And it talks about the fact that there's a there's a there's a guy that was around a bunch of years ago, but he came up with something called the human resources pyramid that it still really speaks to me in a very compelling way 30 years later. And, and what he says, Wade, is that every employee in every organization asks a series of six questions and they ask them in a very particular order. The first question is, what is my job? The second question is, how am I doing? The third question is, does anybody care? The fourth question is, what are we doing? What is our organizational mission? The fifth is, how are we doing? And the last question is, how can I help? What I found as an executive, as a human resources person, we spent an enormous amount of time in answering the last three questions, but we did not create a sense of alignment for people. And so that was what I've tried to do in my book and moving from compliance to commitment is to answer those six questions. What is interesting now is looking back because, you know, this book is now six years old, but even 15 years ago when I was creating my compliance to commitment model, we didn't talk much about a topic that is very near and dear to everybody's heart today. And that is the topic is you, you can't pick up anything in business today and not hear about employee engagement. What I was talking about employee engagement back 15 years ago before it was fashionable. And, and what, I, what they call employee in, engagement today, I call moving from compliance to commitment. Compliance being a situation where the traditional model that we had is you go to work in an organization, uh, we tell you what you need to do. If you're a good employee and we do what you, you do, what we tell you for the most part, you get to keep your job. We're very structured. We dial the rules in. We actually start that process in elementary school of how do you get the A. The problem with that is we're finding is people who are only complying rather than committing to it, we are leaving an enormous amount of resource. We are leaving an enormous amount of energy and emotional commitment behind on the table. If we look at the, the factors out there today, where they're talking about that less than 30% of employees worldwide would consider themselves to be highly engaged. That's, that's trillions of dollars that we're leaving on the table. When I talk about my model of moving from compliance to commitment, it is based on five very, very basic elements. The first element that I talk about and it, it, at some great length is I talk about the element of respect, that we need to recognize that, that when we are managing people, we, are man, you know, we don't manage human capital, we manage people. And the foundation of every relationship with every person in your organization has to be respectful. Now, I am not a touchy-feely guy, so when I talk about the context of respect, what I say to people is, I want to treat you like you're an adult. And what that means is I'm going to give you clear expectations. I'm going to give you feedback when you're not meeting my expectations. I'm going to draw a correlation between your performance and your compensation. That's going to be made very, very clear to you. That, to me, is a respect-based relationship. So what that means is if you're not meeting my expectations and I've done all of those things, then we have a different kind of an issue. The second part of my model is the idea of responsibility. Responsibility says that I give you a scope, I give you an idea of the context of where you fit into the organization, and then I give you the autonomy in order to complete that work and do it well, as long as I'm giving you, I'm calibrating you, and I'm aligning you, and I'm giving you the tools. The third, and this is a very, very important one, is the, is the context of information. Information, like I alluded to uh, about the first couple parts of my book, Information is all about context. It tells you about every task that we ask somebody to perform is in the context of trying to receive, receive a set of organizational goals. Well, management theory for years was we didn't want to bother employees with all that information. I actually read an article as recently as today talking uh, from, a, from a Harvard professor talking about why emotional intelligence is not that important, why it's overrated. Because if you have people performing technical skills and technical jobs, uh, emotional intelligence can actually get in the way and distract them from the performance. Well, let's just say I don't agree with that. Providing them with information on how it fits in, creating that alignment for them, allowing them to join up with you is huge. The next area that we talk about is we talk about the area of rewards. And when I talk about rewards, again, I'm talking about alignment, I'm talking about reinforcement. And when I talk about rewards, I'm, I'm talking about time off, I'm talking about compensation, I'm talking about acknowledgement and recognition, I'm talking about all of those things. But the critical part about that and the part I saw as an executive not done very well is the alignment, where people could, could draw what we call the line of sight. 
to, so this is what I'm doing. This is how it fits in the organization's success. And this is how it means success for me. A lot of compensation systems out there are designed by HR people for other HR people. That's not the audience. And then the last part about it, and this is one that we get a, we get a lot of dialogue about, uh, is the concept of, of loyalty. But when I talk about loyalty in my compliance to commitment model, wait, I'm talking about mutual loyalty. You cannot get more loyalty from people than you are willing to give. And loyalty doesn't mean tenure. It doesn't mean people are with you for a zillion years. What it means is as long as people are on your payroll, as long as people are drawing a check from you, your loyalty to them is represented by clear expectations, fair compensation, and a good work environment. Their loyalty to you is represented by doing their, the best work possible. And I think in looking at a model like that, what it allows people to do is join up with you. One of the core places that I got uh, for the context of my book was, strangely enough, as a, a bunch of years ago, there was a, there was a pretty fun movie out uh, starring Robert Radford called The Horse Whisperer. And I had a chance to see a presentation done by Monty Roberts, who is the guy that that's, that, that that movie is based on. And Roberts has a model that if anybody in the West has heard that what we do is we break a horse. Well, Monty Roberts talks about the idea that breaking a horse is doing something to rather than something with the horse. So he invites horses instead to join up with him. When I listened to what Roberts had to say, what I realized is in many cases, the same way we train horses and deal with horses is the way we deal with our employees. We don't invite them to join up with us. We invite them to comply. When you provide people with that opportunity to join up with you, when you hire the right people, when you create that, that alignment, you create those other things, I had long believed that you're going to see very, very positive performance from it. But at the time when I was, was doing my original research and experimenting with that stuff, the kind of data that we have out there today that talks about employee engagement simply wasn't there. It was largely contextual. And so what I talk about in the next part of my book is my experimentation is working in situations uh, beginning in a copper mine in Arizona, uh, working through a financial services organization, and seeing that by actually putting my model to the test and creating alignment and hiring the right people and creating that congruency and things like that for them, we really could see enormous improvements in performance. And by following that model through and doing it consistently, we would get the kind of gain so that there is something in that for us. Now, the tough part about doing this, as I talk about in here, is this is not a human resources system. In fact, it isn't a system. It's, it's a culture. The nice part about it and the reason that I described the multiple different places that I applied it, Wade, is it says it doesn't have to be in one culture. I, in the work that I've done, I've worked with organizations ranging from heavy manufacturers to uh, research scientists, and I would submit that this model works in any setting. And I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you, you shared, like you were talking about earlier, a lot of great content and context within uh, everything you just discussed. And this next question, I think we, we, we you broke down your book, and now we're going to ask you to even break it down one more time. And that's okay. if the reader could only take away one concept, principle, or action item out of all the great content and context that you just gave us, what would that be? The most important thing that I want people to walk away with from reading this book, Wade, is you manage people, whole people. You don't just manage their intellectual intelligence. You don't just manage their emotional intelligence. You manage it all. And the, the, the important part of that is with 99% of the people that you will encounter, that you work with and that you interact with, if you give them an opportunity to commit with you, to share something with you rather than comply, you will be vastly more successful. The, 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 the kind of end cap on that is leadership is not something that comes with a position or with degrees or things like that. Leadership is a gift that is given to you by people who choose to follow you. And creating a model where they can commit and join up with you versus comply with you is going to be a much stronger model in any organizational setting. Great. Mark, do you have a favorite quote from your book? I do. My favorite quote is, culture eats strategy every time. Hmm. Will, you, will you dive into that just for a second? 
Sure. You can go out and you can hire very expensive consultants and you can develop all kinds of interesting models and you can put data together and all of those things. But at the end of the day is if you do not have a culture where people feel aligned and you do not have the elements of my compliance to commitment model, what you're not going to see, Wade, is you're not going to see the kind of success that an organization like Zappos has or an organization like Apple has, an organization like Amazon has. Because just putting widgets in there and having intellectual strategy does not create that emotional commitment. And so my point is, your strategy is great. But when your strategy meets reality in terms of trust, in terms of that, that, that connection point that people have, is if there's a disconnect there, the best strategy in the world is going to fail. So, Mark, you just gave us a, a very powerful quote. And this next question, we're asking you to give us a, a powerful book, a paradigm shifting book that you've read in the past. It doesn't necessarily have to be on business or anything in particular, but just a book that really, uh, like we said before, created a paradigm shift, but had a huge impact on your life. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat a little bit, but I'm going to give you two. Okay. okay? Uh, the, the first book was a book that was written years and years ago by a guy named Ken Matechka. And the name of that book is Why This Horse Won't Drink. And it's an exploration with all of the models and the psychometrics and all of those things on, on why we weren't engaging people. And it's, a, it's not a very large book. I think it may run 150 pages. And I found it in an obscure setting in a client site. He had never read it. And it really spoke to me. The next book that is a great read that I would recommend for anybody that is currently a leader or anybody that is an emerging leader or desires to be a leader is a book uh, written by a gentleman named J. Michael Abershoff. And J. Michael Abershoff was a commander in the Navy that took over the worst performing ship in the Navy and turned it into the top performing ship in the Navy. And the name of that book is called It's Your Ship. And again, what these both talk about is creating that alignment and lining up with people and giving people the opportunity to contribute at their highest level. Both easy reads, both things that you can take out and you can apply in real time. Thank you. We've actually, we haven't had either one of those mentioned before. So I always, I always love when we get some new books on here. And Mark, before sure. we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to get more information on you and your book, Managing Whole People? Sure. I am a, I, I, I have a, I, a pretty prolific uh, site uh, at my, my website, which is newparadigmsllc.com, where they will probably find out more about me, uh, Wade, than they, they ever wanted to know. There's, a, <laughs> in addition to my book and links to some ebooks that I've written, um, there's also a link to my blog, which I try to publish with some, uh, with some degree of religious commitment to it. Another site for me and that you can find some of my other writings and all is I'm a contributor to a group out of Cary, Indiana. It's called bestthinking.com. Okay, great. Mark, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your book with us. Thank you for the opportunity, Wade. Thanks again for listening in today. If you would like to get your hands on Managing Whole People or any of the other resources mentioned by Mark, just look at the show notes at the elpodcast.com. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.